Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's GT News webinar, Managing Currency Risk in 2014, Protecting Earnings in Volatile Markets, proudly sponsored by FIREP. My name is Teresa Adams, and I will be your host. Our moderator today is Emily Chastain. She's senior editor at the Wall Street Journal CFO, magazine, CFO Journal, where she writes daily news about finance, capital markets, investor relations, corporate governance, tax accounting, and compliance. Also, we have for speakers Wolfgang Koster, CEO and co-founder of FireApp. He has over 25 years of extensive experience in developing and implementing currency risk management programs for Fortune 2000 companies and governments. We have Bilal Hafiz, Managing Director, um, FX Research at Deutsche Bank. Bilal is responsible for formulating the bank's views on currencies. He has also done extensive work on FX as the asset class and creating investable benchmarks for currency returns. Amit Singh, Vice President and Assistant Treasurer at Pfizer Inc. Amit is an engineer by background. He currently manages Pfizer's $40 billion plus cash, manage, or cash investment portfolio for interest rate, credit, and currency risk. His mandate also includes managing Pfizer's short-term liquidity needs and Pfizer's working capital strategies. We also have as a speaker today, Andy Gage, Vice President, Strategic Market Development at FireApps, where he advises corporations, consulting firms, and business partners on a wide range of foreign exchange exposure management topics and emerging industry best practices. Before we begin, please listen to the following housekeeping points. If you experience any technical difficulties, please type them into the Q&A panel located on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. There will be a WebEx producer to respond to your message immediately. Also, questions for the speakers should be typed into the Q&A panel as well. We will address as many of those at the end of the presentation. Please ensure to send your questions to all panelists. Otherwise, we may not be able to read them out loud. Finally, this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss anything or think a colleague would be interested, you will be sent a link to access the recording within the next week. I'd now like to hand you over to our moderator, Emily Chessane. Welcome, Emily, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Sharika, for the introduction. Um, so it's great to do this webinar today because it's a really interesting time for currencies out there. Um, with big giant swings in the yen and the euro. Um, ever since a few years ago in the euro crisis, companies have been very nervous about how to move currency around um, and how to get that explained properly to investors and in their earnings. Um, but in the past year, we've seen companies sort of get the euro and the yen under control, but they've been caught off guard a little bit more by, by Brazil, Canada, Australia, Venezuela, India, um, in all of these places where currencies are moving and having giant swings. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the multinational impacts um, that companies are trying to manage and ways to manage it, and what's going on looking forward into 2014 as you know China's on the horizon um, and Australia's moving in tandem with that and how companies can respond um, in their efforts. So with that, I think Andy has some new research out about what the impacts on currency looked like in 2013. And so we'll go to you, Andy. Thanks, Emily. I, I appreciate that and uh, welcome to everybody in attendance. And, and just to give everybody a little bit of perspective as, as we go through the, the panel discussion today, um, I'm going to provide a little bit of background on, on some research that we've done on how companies have been impacted by, by uh, corporate earnings, uh, by, uh, by currencies. Uh, Wolfgang Koester, our, our CEO, uh, will also be chiming in. I'm, he is actually in the, in the process of uh, just getting out of a, a meeting in Germany. I think he's logging on 
and uh, if he comes in, I'm going to have him uh, uh, jump in. Uh, Wolfgang, are you are you online yet? I am. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I am. I uh, we can hear you just Great. fine. Wolfgang, as we get started here, perhaps you could just kind of give a, a quick overview of of our company and and our focus, and then I will uh, go through the the actual research itself. Sure. Um, thank you, everybody, for the time. I would like to, you know, uh, especially thank Emily Ball and uh, and Amit for taking the time today. I think it'll be a very interesting session. We're going to try to keep from the fire outside our comments a little bit limited and really have you hear from Amit and also from an economic point of view from from, uh, Ball, from the Deutsche Bank side of what we're all seeing there. And I'm really thankful for Emily being able to uh, uh, moderate this as. Everybody here understands we, Fire Apps, have been in the business now since 2000, uh, the year 2000 to be exact, and came out with a technology in 2006 to support corporations and really understand their currency exposures wherever they are and whatever they are. Um, from a per point of view of corporation, today we're seen as the data analytics for corporate foreign exchange, obviously web-based with customers all over the world. Um, as Andy just mentioned us came out of a meeting in uh, outside of Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, Andy, I'd love for you to uh, kind of take through the research, and then I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Wolfgang. So um, each each quarter, we uh, we do research on roughly 850 multinational corporations, and we've been doing this now for about three years. As we go through that research, we're examining how companies are disclosing impacts from currencies throughout their uh, financial statements. Uh, we look at, at their, uh, their financial releases, we, we monitor the earnings calls, and, and our goal is to really get a sense on how currencies have impacted corporates, how uh, corporate executives are responding to that, and, and how the analyst and investor community is is examining the currency impact on corporate performance. So we just released our, our uh, most uh, recent uh, earnings uh, analysis uh, based on, on the Q4 of 2013, and we also looked at it on an annualized basis. So some, some key facts that we, we've noticed as uh, we've done the, the, the last round of research is that there are a, a, an increasing number of companies that are uh, disclosing impacts to earnings and earnings per share over the last couple of years. You can see the graphic here of sort of a steady trend since, as Emily mentioned, uh, about the time of the, the onset of the financial crisis, there's been a, a siege of, of volatility from a number of different uh, sectors in, in the currency markets. When we look at the aggregate impact uh, that we're able to, to glean out of the disclosures, what we saw in the last quarter is roughly about a $6 billion impact uh, that was disclosed across all of the companies that, that disclosed financial uh, losses uh, related to, to foreign exchange. Now that's up about 40% uh, from the prior quarter. So the fourth quarter was a particularly difficult uh, quarter uh, in, in 2013 from a, uh, from a currency standpoint. Now, if we go back a, a year ago, we were certainly seeing a lot more impact, or back into 2012, we saw a lot more impact in the euro, given the, the euro crisis, uh, but we saw a consistent impact and an increasing impact over the, uh, the four quarters in, in 2013, really peaking uh, at the end of 2013. From our analysis, as we look at, at the impacts that are out there, each, each quarter presents its own set of unique uh, circumstances and surprises. Uh, as we looked at, at what was happening at the beginning of last year, obviously the, the abonomics and the Yindi valuation certainly caught a number of companies off guard and, and, and caused a lot of impacts, and we saw that for, for a number of quarters. Um, but we saw some interesting wrinkles in this last quarter, given some, some uh, behavior in the emerging markets as well, uh, China, and uh, there's a couple of other surprises as we look a little bit deeper in the research. Um, as we go down to the, if, as we go to the next uh, slide here, um, this is a, a, a becoming a much more of a pressing issue. As we examine the earnings calls and we examine uh, the disclosures, Given the rapid uh, succession of, of currency impacts and, and currency challenges, as Emily mentioned, um, it's becoming much more of a front burner issue, not just for 
the typical treasurer and finance organization, but this is really front burner agenda for, for the CFOs and increasing the CEOs because the, the analysts are really asking a lot more questions that are a lot more sensitized to what we're seeing out of the emerging markets uh, crisis and now with China and some of the activity that we've seen there, um, they're, they're asking a lot tougher questions. Now, if we, we examine this slide here, this is a very interesting story here because this really shows you from a, from a, a disclosure standpoint what currencies are causing the most concern in the, in the largest impacts uh, from the, the earnings uh, announcements that, that companies are disclosing. So if you go back to the beginning of 2001 or 2013 Q1, obviously the yen was, is, was right at the top there and then you had a right behind that you had the, the devaluation by Venezuela that, that certainly caused a lot of problems there. But you know the euro was a very common uh, currency that was also frequently disclosed there. And Brazil has always been and increasingly so uh, a, a front burner currency as well. Now, as you get towards the back half of the year, as Emily mentioned, the yen uh, became uh, less of a, a challenge. And interestingly enough for us, the euro really fell off the map in terms of disclosures, and Bilal can provide some insight into that uh, as he goes through his research. Um, but the, the thing that really caught, jumped out of this last, uh, last quarter was the Canadian dollar. And I think this really just goes back to the, the fundamental issue that the corporates really have a very complex set of currency challenges. It's not just one currency, as Emily mentioned. It's not just the yen, it's not just the euro. Currency impacts can hit you from any number of issues. And as we saw the, the lead off to uh, the earnings uh, environment in, in, uh, as, as companies were going through their disclosures, um, the emerging market volatility right at the beginning of, of January caught a lot of people under uh, underprepared for that and, and really drew a lot of questions. Now, one of the more complex issues that companies are, are dealing with right now, and, we'll, and, and Bilal will go into this in a little bit more detail, is China. Um, in the last week, we've seen a significant drop off in the yen versus the dollar, uh, which is counter to what most companies expect there. We believe that's going to be a, a bigger problem, and I know that Bilal is going to have a, a lot more uh, comment on that. But we're at a very unique uh, time from a China standpoint, and, and that's going to, we believe, cause some greater heartburn for corporates over the next uh, couple of years here. Um, the, the other key thing, is, as I mentioned, is the level of scrutiny that analysts are, are uh, applying to this it has really gone up. Um, two, three years ago, the, the questions from the analyst communities to CEOs and CFOs would be, uh, can you help me understand the, the currency impact on the quarter? Now the questions are much more specific. They're really dissecting, tell me about that emerging market risk. How is that impacting your EBITDA? How is that impacting your earnings per share? What steps are you taking? Um, and the, the, the questions are not just directed to the CFO. They are really more of a group of, of, of analysts going after a, an entire dialogue with CEOs and CFOs. And we saw that a number of times in this last earnings season. And I think Part of that was, was due to the heightened sensitivity uh, to the emerging market issues that, that companies were struggling with. But this is a bit of you know, paying for uh, what companies were doing a couple of years ago, as, as Wolfgang and I have discussed in the past, where companies were really moving aggressively to grow their business in emerging markets. We're now seeing the cost and the risk associated with that coming, coming to bear. And uh, that, that will, uh, I believe, continue to be a challenge. So at the end of the day, you've got a very complex set of circumstances for U.S. Uh, and, and European corporates. You've got a number of different currency pairs. It's not just, you know, one or two or five. There are, you know, tens if not hundreds of currency relationships that, that corporates have to deal with. And you really need to be able to look at it on a, on a portfolio basis. But given what we're seeing from the increased desire for globalization, the increased volatility that we're seeing from a number of different parts of the, of the market, and the operational complexity that, that companies are dealing with, um, there's a, an increased focus on uh, being prepared to deal with the, the earnings and the EPS at risk. And, and from our standpoint, uh, there's really uh, a, a benchmark out there that, that companies are striving for, and that's roughly one cent on earnings per share basis. That's the benchmark, and, and companies need to take better steps to prepare for that. And we'll get back into that in, in a moment. So, Emily, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And, um, and uh, you, uh, any questions for Wolfgang or I before we, we move on to Bilal's session? Yeah, just going off um, what you said, um, it's interesting to look at the 
total number of currency pairs available in the world. I think as Wolfgang says, there's something like 16,110 potential currency pairs. And so we know that companies often look at their top five exposures um, and say, you know, we have much more ex risk in particular countries like euro, dollar. Um, is that a good strategy in this kind of market? Or when you see surprises like that, how can companies change that strategy? Wolfgang, you want to yeah. field that one? Yeah, I absolutely would love to, especially since, you know, we see this issue every single day. Yesterday I met with a, a corporation's chief financial officer who said that uh, roughly 80, 85 percent of their exposures was in euro, U.S. dollar, and uh, they really focused only on euro, U.S. dollar. And the reason they were now talking about this is because the other 15 percent were roughly equally split between Turkey, Brazil, and uh, and Russia. And uh, that became a significant problem to them, though from a volume point of view, it was not very large. And they felt that their 2080 rule was actually a pretty good rule, so they would just focus on managing euro, U.S. dollar. So they really didn't have a bunch of currency pairs, but unfortunately, the luck of the draw for them is the three major other currency pairs that they have were people that they got hurt with over the last six months all in one slew. So fact of the matter is that we're seeing just an increased amount of uh, of people focusing on the entire portfolio of currencies and not just on their top one, two, three, or five currency pairs and ignoring the ones that may be smaller because that's where literally the pain can come from. But I'm, it'll be very interesting to hear how Amit is, is managing through that process as well. And um, you talked about analysts, Andy. Um, are, are they asking specifically about you know, specific currencies, um, how, how specific are their questions to companies getting an earnings about currency management? As we look at the research, uh, the, the conversation would often get started around uh, a specific emerging market concern that companies have had as companies have been building out their, their, their business in emerging markets. But the, the questions as, as more and more analysts began participating in the dialogue, they, they began to move beyond just a, a single currency into how are you looking at currency risk, how much is currency going to impact your earnings, and what steps are you taking to, to really deal with that and, and how well prepared. So uh, it's becoming more of a, I, I think the analyst community is becoming much more informed that currency risk really needs to be managed on a much more broad-based basis, and it's not just going after those one or two currencies that are showing up at any given point in time. It's, it's how do you tap that down across the board to, to eliminate the volatility. Right, yeah, it's interesting as companies look for more and more growth in emerging markets, what the additional risks are where you can grow, but you know, a currency move can sort of take that growth away. And so I think it's a good point to turn over to the law. Um, you could sort of tell us what you're seeing in, in your outlook for 2014. Sure, thank you very much, and, and greetings to everyone on the call. Um, I, I think we're at a critical turning point for markets right now, and in fact, I think 2013 marked that turning point. If one remembers between 2008 and 2012, all the focus of markets was first on the U.S. and its financial system woes, uh, starting from Lehman's, uh, and then the Fed's response to that, which was uh, extensive QE. Um, and then also subsequent to that, it was the European crisis. So for, for you know, four or five years, it was all about developed world crises. And during that time, the dollar was weak. Um, risk aversion was the order of the day. However, emerging markets generally traded quite well. And there was a, a notion that the developed world was on its knees and emerging markets uh, was and is the future. Um, last year, I think, though, marks a turning point for that. And last year, we all noted that there wasn't another European crisis, that the Fed started to unwind its QE. There were signs of recovery in, in Europe and the U.S. Japan was looking healthier as well. And interestingly, the bounce of volatility we did have last year was in emerging markets. So the biggest moves in currencies actually were in emerging markets in anticipation of the Fed's taper. It started with the Fragile Five, uh, which were the more vulnerable emerging market currencies that had large current account deficits, currencies like Brazil, Indonesia, India, South Africa, and Turkey. However, uh, by the end of last year, it also uh, jumped to other currencies as well, whether it was 
um, and, and also earlier this year, whether it was Argentina with its uh, large uh, devaluation or Russia because of its issues uh, with Ukraine, and more recently China has come into, into play as well. And if we step back and think about emerging markets, what becomes evident is that emerging markets have had a spectacular period of growth from the early 2000s, and that was, in fact, the beginning of a multi-year dollar downtrend. And what helped uh, emerging markets was partly uh, a structural story, so the rise of the middle class, um, uh, urbanization, particularly in China, a commodity boom uh, that was associated with that, then also uh, that also helped uh, the rest of the commodity exporting nations. And what uh, turbocharged that uh, growth after 2008 was the fact that the Fed was doing QE. So all this money printing that the Fed did found its way one way or the other to emerging markets. And if we look at cross-border bank lending, the largest increase in cross-border lending went to emerging markets from the developed world. So what's evident is that the one area that banks were willing to lend to were, was anything to do with emerging markets. And what that allowed EM to do was to hide some of their underlying weaknesses by this wall of money that was coming towards them. Now, with the Fed in taper mode, all those cracks are now starting to become more apparent. And to caricature the various regions in emerging markets, uh, the way I would talk about each region uh, is that Asia, I would argue, has a problem with too much credit, and there's all sorts of asset bubbles across Asia. Um, emerging Europe, I would say, has an issue with unemployment, and uh, associated with that is social unrest. And Latin America, I would argue, has an inflation problem. So Brazil has inflation, and the central bank has been increasing interest rates to stop that. Venezuela has extremely high inflation, as does Argentina. So Latin America is much more of an inflation story. So all of these issues are coming to the fore. China, I think, is, is obviously the big story, because China, to some extent, uh, is emerging markets. And I think that the China story is fascinating. Um, what is clear is that policymakers in China are aware of all the bubbles that have been forming, uh, that there has been too much credit, and as a result, returns on investments have been falling. There's not enough moral hazard, as there's a perception in China that everyone will be bailed out. The new reforms that the administration in China are introducing are an attempt to rein in all of that credit. So last year, there was a major clampdown on corruption and liberalization of the interest rate markets. And more recently, interestingly, they've started to focus on currency. Um, the Chinese currency was, has been one uh, big carry trade in many ways. It offers higher interest rates than the U.S., and so as a result, many people have been piling into China as the carry trade, particularly as there was a sense that the currency would also appreciate. There's not much volatility in the currency, as policymakers would make sure volatility is low. That's all changed. At the end of February, we saw the largest one-week decline in the renminbi for a long, long time. And just this recent weekend, the authorities in China widened the band in dollar China, so that now dollar China could, in theory, move plus or minus 2% around the fix. So I think there's a real possibility that dollar China, which at the moment is trading uh, around 617, 618, it could trade up to around 630 by the end of this year, which would be uh, the first kind of reversal of the strong appreciation trend we've seen in the renminbi for the past five, six years. It, it could be the first time that the renminbi could weaken over the course of the year. So I think this is a very big story. It's symptomatic of um, a broader story in emerging markets, which is that developed uh, markets have paid for their sins, so to speak. Now it's a turn of emerging markets, and we're in the midst of a big dollar turn against many of these currencies. And this is just the beginning when the Fed starts to accelerate their tapering, increasing policy rates next year. This will all lead to much bigger moves in currencies. And it will be a volatile move. Um, and uh, and it, I think this will be a, a big story going forward. Um, just a short word on euro dollar. Euro dollar has been trading very strong over the last six, seven months. I think at some point over the course of this year, as low inflation gets more embedded in Europe, the ECB will maintain uh, kind of an on-hold policy 
um, possibly even easing at some point, where, where the Fed will start to uh, pick up its rhetoric on timing, uh, especially once we get past the, the, the weak weather-related data that we've had over the past few months. I think then euro dollar will start to weaken. Um, so I, you know, I would expect euro dollar to head down towards 125 or so in the next 12, 12 months or so. It's more of a, uh, a relative central bank story, um, but I think really the bigger story is, is, is emerging markets. I think that's where the volatility will be. Yeah, Bilal, um, that was really interesting insights. Um, going back to China for a minute, you know, it's interesting in a country that has a big shadow banking system and where it's also very hard for corporations to um, extract money from China. Um, curious what's going on there and then also what the side effects are for countries like Australia where they sell a lot of commodities into China. Sure. Well, uh, what China has been doing is that they have been trying to open up the capital account in China to make it easier for people to invest in China and also for corporates to um, invest in China um, and possibly also take money out. And, and they are trying to accelerate those reforms. So they're saying within the next two or three years, many of the controls that are in place that prevent cross-border flows from China will be removed. Time will tell whether they will do, do that. At the moment, they're um, making it easier for foreigners to put money into China, not necessarily for money to go out. Um, but those reforms are kind of coming, uh, coming into play. The, the bigger reforms that they are focusing on is that they're trying to reduce the dependence of Chinese corporates on cheap money. Um, either through interest rates being held too low for too long or through Chinese corporates not being exposed to currency risk. So they're slowly trying to introduce more volatility so that Chinese corporates get prepared for a future where the currencies will move like any other Asian currency. Um, there still are challenges for foreign companies to take money out of China. Those are still, there are still are challenges there. Um, uh, and the main target, though, for China at the moment is, is really for Chinese corporates to um, become more efficient uh, in a world where the state, the government, will step back. In relation to Australia, of course, Australia will be hit hard or has been hit hard by the decline in commodity prices. It has weakened a lot already. Um, I think some of the Australian dollar weakness is also related to the fact that U.S. interest rates have gone up. Um, the other currency that has been hit quite hard by the decline in commodity prices has been the Chilean peso, which is a very large copper price exporter. Copper prices have been declining quite, quite significantly. So there's both Australia and uh, Chile that have been affected by this decline in, in commodity prices. And the other question I had for you, Bilal, is, you know, a lot of times companies say they can put in natural hedges to try and um, – affect the situation and natural hedges in the business, is that going to work when you have an issue like China on the horizon? Um, well, ideally companies, if they have a choice, they would like to put natural hedges, i.e. where um, all, all the costs are matched with revenues in that country. Now, in many cases, uh, especially with a country like China, it's it's not necessarily that easy to do that because of the capital uh, account controls. Whereas if you uh, ship too much of your um, uh, cash inflows and outflows into China, uh, you may not be able to get the money out. So in the case of China, it's much more difficult to have those natural hedges compared to other countries that have um, liberalized capital accounts. So it's, it's more difficult. On, um, on, on, on that front. Um, the, the other issue um, also in terms of natural hedges is, um, is the issue of the cost of hedging. Um, so that's another consideration to think about whether um, in some countries uh, um, the difference between having your assets uh, and your liabilities in that country and doing the currency hedge the costs aren't too different, so it may not necessarily make sense to have a natural hedge in that country, whereas in other countries there's a big gap between the two, uh, in which case it makes more sense to, to have a natural hedge. Um, and that, that kind of relates to sort of just certain distortions in the, um, in, in, in the currency forwards market. So with some of the, the more frontier emerging markets, that's definitely the, the case. Well, that was a good 
turning point to a meet where I'm sure you're managing a lot of the cost of hedging um, throughout your portfolio. So maybe you could start us off on what you're seeing and what you expect for 2014. Sure. Thank you, Emily. Good day, everybody. Uh, I'm the Sister Treasurer at Pfizer for Risk Management in New York. Um, wanted to do a couple of things in my initial remarks. First, to give you a quick, very brief up, uh, overview of Pfizer as a world, one of the world's largest research-based pharmaceutical companies. And then uh, from then on, um, talk a little bit about my views on uh, currency management um, by corporates. So very quickly, Pfizer, as, uh, as it stands today, the numbers, uh, you know, it's obviously a very large company. Our revenues in 2012 were close to 60 billion, which has come down a little bit given our recent divestitures of a <clears throat> couple of pieces of our business. You know, um, we, large cash flows spread over many countries. <clears throat> All of this is to show, obviously, we are sitting on uh, a very large, complex organization, which, of course, brings it to itself um, the currency risk that we are here to talk about today. Pfizer products, many of them are household names, Lipitor, Advil, uh, Viagra, Lyrica for Pain, these are all um, products that we are well familiar with. On the R&D side, you know, we have a presence in a lot of different uh, and important therapeutic areas. The company is doing a lot of uh, cutting edge research in these, these areas. And finally, we, we have a established, established and growing presence in emerging markets, which you know, a lot of people on this panel have commented on, and clearly we, we are sitting on um, many of the, the currency risks and exposures that we've been talking about. Um, before I begin, just a quick uh, quick sense of how Pfizer's uh, currency analytics is uh, is um, currently in place. We have, we use uh, Fire Apps, of course, they, as a as a software that helps us you know, identify, analyze, collate exposures, and keep track of them. And so Fire Apps is fully integrated on one end with our treasury management system, and on the other end with our um, uh, trading platform. So with that, let me let me go into my second part of the prepared remarks, which is uh, to talk about my views on currency risk management from a corporate perspective. And here I wanted to really touch upon three key, key areas. One, uh, to start out with the question of do we care? Um, do we care for risk management in, uh, as a financial strategy in general? And specifically, do we care for currency risk uh, management? And then go into in the second uh, key area, go into should a company or should a, a corporate that that whose core, core business is not currency uh, risk related, currency related, should they be uh, hedging currency risk at all? And lastly, if the answer is yes, then lastly, how should a, a firm look at their currency um, risk management program if they are designing a new one or if they're evaluating one that's already in place? So let me go into each one one at a time. So starting with the role of risk management in general. Um, the answer to the question, do we care, does risk management matter from a corporate uh, financial strategy management is, of course, yes. Because if you think of the four key areas where financial strategy resides, the first one, of course, is your capital allocation, which is answer to the question, where do you, where do you place your investments, how do you invest? Um, second, you know, what, what's your optimal capital structure, which is, you know, how do you fund your business, debt, equity, uh, and the mix? Thirdly, how do you manage your liquidity risk, which is, you know, even as a going concern uh, and a profitable company, how do you keep yourself liquid and uh, manage your liquid day-to-day -day liquidity? And of course, lastly, which is where this topic comes in, managing market risk. And by market risk, I mean non-core risk uh, to your business. And depending on what business company is in, this market risk or non-core core risk could mean a combination of currency risk, commodity risk, interest rate, credit risk, et cetera. So clearly to me, you know, managing FX risk is, is, is it, it is indeed a part of company's core financial strategy. And in this means to me also that every firm should have a view on this topic, regardless of whether they decide to hedge part of, none of, or all of their currency risks. So let me go into the second, second key area I mentioned, which is should a, should a company uh, look at hedging their currency or, or other market risks or non-core risks uh, at all? And, and, and these, these are all questions that are not obvious uh, or not trivial answers. Uh, should a firm hedge? Should a firm hedge a particular risk? Uh, and opinions, you know, of course, are as varied as uh, from the, you know, uh, business school professors that's, that would tell us uh, 
there's no point in hedging because investors can hedge uh, more efficiently in firms for, uh, th than the firms, all the way to more practical investors have no idea what the real exposure for the firm is, and therefore um, the firm should should uh, hedge themselves, especially if that is not your core risk. Um, and of course, as in re as in real life, the reality is somewhere in the middle of these extremes, and the answer probably depends on what the firm uh, on the firm and the industry. And I do believe that in, at a fundamental level, if hedging does make sense, if it it leads to more predictable cash flows, and we we could all argue, but uh, it makes sense that all else equal, the more predictable a firm's cash flows are, it likely it is more likely to be rewarded with a higher multiple uh, when it comes to market capitalization. So, what are the factors that the firm should at least at a high level look at in making a decision for whether hedging a currency risk at all makes sense? And so, I, I can think of two or three. One, of course, is your risk tolerance, which is your your uh, position in the credit uh, credit spectrum. And if the firm, of course, is uh, at the lower end of the credit spectrum, clearly it has lower risk tolerance. And, and if currency risk can impact the cash flows, it can push the firm into financial distress, and therefore. Make, clearly makes sense to do some, uh, you know, uh, smart financial uh, and FX hedging for those firms. And it, of course, uh, the second second point to evaluate is whether firms firm has any pricing pass through power. And by that I mean, if the firm firm is in the enviable industry where they can pass on the pricing uh, increase when the when the currency rate changes in a timely manner then that's great and you don't need to hedge, but uh, that's likely not the case for most of us these days. And lastly, you know, also matters, and, and, and Andy mentioned this in his, in his presentation, the, 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 the story with the uh, analysts, the confusion in the market, the, you know, it matters whether your competitors in your industry is hedging. It's some, uh, in that case, it may make sense to at least take a look at what others are doing, um, and in times of great, great uh, currency volatility, Make sure that everybody understands what you're doing and what what your firm is hedging or not hedging. So with that, uh, let me go to the third point that I initially mentioned. I wanted to talk about, which is uh, a firm. Let's say the firm has looked at their fact pattern and decided that it makes sense for them to at least evaluate the currency risk and, and potentially hedge it. What are the things they should be doing and and do in in, in uh, by way of planning and executing? And I, I think of three simple steps. Uh, at least in, in, in talking about it, it seems simple. They may not be so simple in implementing. But the first one to me is just quantifying your exposures. Uh, second one, of course, is to then uh, figure, think of what your goals are, and then finally to execute and communicate those goals. So let me take uh, each one very quickly, um, just briefly. So quantifying exposures. And this is where you know uh, uh, tools like Fire Apps can be very, very handy because for most of us large companies, your exposures are all across the world, your supply chain is, is complex, and to know which currencies you're exposed to at any given point, uh, and what types of exposure are we talking about, transactional cash flow type, earnings exposure, uh, or are we talking about net equity exposure? Those are all important, and these you need to plan before you make up your mind as to which ones are uh, a must, must hedge. Then if you look at uh, setting the strategy, you want to know what your goals are. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to hedge earnings volatility? Some companies want to uh, hedge the variance to their budget rate. Um, and whatever your goals are, you, you have to make sure your strategy is aligned to that. And this would also entail thinking about which instruments, uh, be it forwards, options, or, or a combination that would, that would matter. Um, you should also be looking at um, hedging uh, tenor, and by that I mean if you're looking at forecasted exposures that you are uh, looking to uh, hedge, then how long, uh, how how far out should you be going out in order to do a cost-benefit analysis? And finally, for most of the firms um, that are not in the financial services or financial business, hedge accounting matters because we don't want to live with the uh, volatility given to. Uh, given the derivative uh, being marked to market at the end of every period. So it's clearly an important factor. So lastly, um, once the program is in place, hopefully it's an effective program, it needs to be, it needs to be uh, communicated with the street uh, be because the market needs to understand what the firm, uh, how the firm is managing uh, their currency risk. So in closing, I would say, you know, for, for the firms, um, let's not make the mistake of, uh, you know, 
proverbially looking for quarters under the lamppost because you know that's where the light is and that's where it's easy to hedge. That's where it's easy to look. Um, and at, at times, firms end up uh, you know hedging currency risk because it's there is a market out there for currency risk as opposed to other macro risks like inflation that may be harder to hedge. So let's hedge it because we can. Let's not make that mistake. Uh, let's hedge if, because we, we want to do it. It's conscious decision and it's thoughtfully designed program. So let me pause there, uh, see if uh, Emily or others yeah, have any questions. Yeah, I have a few questions. questions for you, Amit. Um, you know, interesting in the looking at the last year, you know, how currency sort of make big moves, sometimes unexpectedly in the middle of the quarter, like the Australian dollar in the fourth quarter, you know, hit a fresh low and sort of had a deeper fall than the other quarters. I mean, as policies change, as, you know, commodity prices change, um, you know, in the middle of a quarter, how do you manage a big currency move if that's something that comes up or takes you by surprise? So that's a good question. And, uh, you know, I, I would answer it uh, in two ways. One is that, you know, generally speaking, if you have a, uh, what what is called, uh, what, you know, some, some of us call the forecast or cash flow hedging program, and it, it's well designed and you have one in place, then a big move like the ones we saw in yen, uh, you know, going from 75 to 100, et cetera, should, should be considerably smoothed out when, you, when it comes to your earnings impact on earnings. So that's clearly on the earnings side. And also on the, on the balance sheet where you're hedging, you know, your assets on your balance sheet. Again, if you have a fully functioning program, those, those uh, exposures get or should get hedged the moment they rise and therefore also minimize the impact. So our approach is to, for hedging on the currency side at least is risk mitigation. And hence we try to be agnostic to the current levels of the currencies, and we, we have, you know, uh, programs in place that we try not to tweak, accelerate, stop, or uh, anything like that in, in response to, you know, the most recent swing, because we don't believe we have the ability to forecast either in the short, short run or the long run. Um, so we, we don't think that we, we make course corrections every time we see a move. Yeah, and the other question I have for you too is, um, you know, for a lot of companies, hedging can get expensive, especially if the market goes the wrong way. But even just the regular cost of hedging can be expensive if everybody wants to hedge the end, you know, this month, then it's going to be a little bit expensive to put on a hedge. Um, so, how how can companies sort of control and manage that cost? Yeah, there's several practical things you could do. Um, you know, one one is of course uh, trying to you know, concentrate your exposures to certain what we in, in our industry call supply points or some, some companies call it FX centers, where if you, the, more, the fewer those centers are, the more netting you can do across your exposures, and therefore you, you don't end up hedging both legs of the exposures unnecessarily and paying, you know, bid asks on both sides. So that makes sense. The other thing that, that is a little bit less intuitive is, uh, if, especially when you're looking at hedging uh, out in the future, your uh, earnings or cash flows in the future, it's important to look at how far out you're going. And if your aim is simply to smooth your earnings, going out three years may, may not get you incremental smoothing adjusted for cost of hedging that you may get, uh, you know, a similar smoothing impact from a one year of hedging. And generally, since hedging longer tenors is more expensive, that could be another way to look at it. The uh, other way I would say is to plan, uh, you know, and this is easier said than done, but to reduce what, what's called the churn. So a lot of times companies end up over hedging and then correct course correcting, going taking hedges the other way, then, then under hedging and then course correcting the, the, the reverse way. The more you can minimize that um, by perhaps better communication within the company, that could also help in uh, reducing your cost. So I think we're, we're going to move over to the Q&A um, session. So if anybody from the audience has questions, now's the time to put those in. Um, but to start off, I think maybe with Bilal, and you can have the other panelists chime in as well, but, um, you know, everyone's looking for growth in emerging markets, and, you know, obviously there are currency risks that accompany those like we've been talking about. Um, so before companies even set up operations, I mean, what what is there to think about from a currency perspective in um, – managing currency risk in emerging markets? Um, well, I think, I mean, the first thing to think about with emerging markets, I mean, just very, very big picture, very long term, you know, uh, emerging markets, um, 
structurally will do uh, very well economically. So as a share of global growth, the size of their economies, rising middle class and so on, in the very long run, uh, there's a genuine story of, of EM you know, com coming through. So these are very big markets. Um, they will be profitable markets and so on. Um, so, you know, one needs to kind of bear in mind that, you know, in the very long term, you know, there's a, there's a good reason to invest in emerging markets. However, in the next few years, I think we'll see a lot of volatility in emerging markets. And I think that for the last 10, maybe even 15 years, we've grown quite accustomed to thinking about emerging markets as relatively safe, um, much more so than we thought about EM in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I think that's misplaced. I think there's lots of risks in emerging markets still, um, yeah, just as there are in, in developed markets. So the types of moves we have seen in the Australian dollar historically or the yen, those types of moves can also be seen in emerging markets. Um, so, so what I would say is, you know, in the long run, you know, there, there's a real compelling story, but there is still um, a, a high chance of volatility, particularly in the next few years. And, you know, currencies never move in a straight line. And so what I would say is that there has been a general tendency by corporates not to hedge their currency exposure in emerging markets, because there's this notion that if they are growing, then almost necessarily their currency should appreciate and the dollar should weaken. Um, so there's no need, there's a bias to say there's no need to currency hedge, but I think that is that is not the case. Uh, EM currencies can weaken, and I think particularly at this stage of the dollar cycle, there's a high chance that they could. So I think it's very prudent to think about ways that one can uh, hedge the currency. And if you generally look at the currency over the very long run, the relationship between currencies and growth, it's quite mixed. Often you see economies do very well with weak currencies, perhaps because of weak currencies. Sometimes uh, you see the opposite as well. So, for example, if you look at some of the currencies that have weakened a lot in the last six months, like India, South Africa, um, you're now starting to see that currency weakness now is starting to help their economies. So, for example, India's uh, uh, and South Africa's export numbers have started to pick up. The economies are starting to pick up as well. So, a currency weakness um, is, is kind of being uh, associated now with growth rather than the reverse. Um, so, that's kind of the, some general points I would make. And then the, the more micro point I would make is just the ways one can uh, do currency hedges. Uh, in EM, it's more complicated than in developed markets. So often you have what's called non-deliverable forwards rather than um, uh, onshore forwards, which complicates the picture a bit. Sometimes there's capital controls and, and so on. So there's kind of more implementation risk uh, around hedges for emerging markets. And so one kind of needs to um, be a bit more diligent and, and keep on top of the hedges that one has in the EM than uh, one would otherwise have in developed markets. Yeah, just a follow-up on that, Bilal, from the audience. Um, if the emerging market challenges are inflation, unemployment, credit bubbles that you mentioned are, are escalating like that, um, what do you think the impact would be on developed markets? I mean, is that something that could... Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there, for sure there will be an impact. I mean, the way I would think about it would be to think about which developed markets have been quite reliant on emerging market growth in recent years. Um, and if you go through which economies have, the U.S. is not so much. The U.S. is more of a domestic story, which is related to, um, you know, uh, households in the U.S. finally starting to spend more money, U.S. government, you know, cutting back. On its spending now, now it's starting to stop that. That will help the U.S. economy. So the U.S. story isn't really an export story. So I think the U.S. won't really be affected too much by uh, an emerging market uh, slowdown. Um, however, Europe, I think, will be, particularly Germany. Germany's uh, benefited a lot from Asian growth in particular. So if you look at um, – if you just anecdotally, if you go to Shanghai or Beijing, the amount of German cars that you see there, um, luxury brands, is just phenomenal. And that's you know, part of the reason why Germany has done so well in recent years. So I think Germany could be hit by the slowdown in emerging markets, and that could impact the euro area as a whole, and, and hence the euro. And I think the other ones would be the commodity currencies, uh, particularly Australia, as we talked about earlier. Also Canada, to some extent as well, is a commodity exporter. 
um, and perhaps even Norway as well as another commodity exporter. So some, some of the commodity guys, and in terms of the bigger economies, I would say uh, Germany would be impacted. Japan less so, because I think Japan, there's more of a domestic story that's going on in Japan linked to Abenomics, which is about um, uh, just uh, uh, um, creating inflation to reduce the cost of the real cost of investing. So there's more of kind of a domestic-led uh, story to, to the Japanese story overall. Yeah, but Wolfgang, is there anything that you've seen companies do sort of to, as they look at expanding in new markets, um, what to do to manage currency exposures? I think that the, the fundamental of financial risk management really comes down to making sure that nobody is surprised, whether it's the owners, whether it's investors, et cetera, et cetera. So clearly understanding what the exposures are that one is exposed to and then what risk mitigation one does or does not do and what the resulting impact of that is is really key here. So really understanding the exposures and then being able to communicate those succinctly towards the risk that company is willing to take and not willing to take. So as in they're going into new markets, if you're a motor company and you're going into Russia and all of a sudden you're projecting all this growth and you are seeing that growth, but then on the other hand, you are not really clearly communicating the currency risk associated, and then that happens, that becomes a problem. So at the end of the day, as you're going into new markets, make sure that you really understand the exposures, and then either what risk are you willing to take and then communicate that properly, or what risk mitigation you're willing to take and ensure that you understand the cost thereof. Okay. And Amit, you know, a question for you. Um, some people were asking from the audience, you know, can hedging be sort of justified as the cost of, as an insurance policy premium? Or, you know, people, companies talk all the time about, um, you know, I don't want to hedge because I don't want to speculate. Or, you know, they even say that, you know, it's just accounting translation risk and, you know, it doesn't really affect cash. I'm curious, you know, what you think of that in terms of, you know, is it an insurance policy premium? Is that how you can justify it? Um, is it speculation? What do you, what do you think about? Mm -hmm. I, I don't look at it as speculation unless you design it as a speculative trade. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, it, it's the goal of your program that, that determines whether it ends up being uh, speculation or it ends up actually being risk mitigation. If you are really uh, and truly looking to smooth the earnings uh, over time and remove the volatility caused in the earnings due to currency risk, then you would design uh, a layered, uh, you know, rolling type of type of hedges um, to, in place and, and you will not tweak it uh, all the time based on, um, you know, immediate and quick, quick moves in the market. And if you follow those rules, then you are not speculating and you are truly smoothing. However, uh, I've seen um, situations where CFOs are, are reluctant to, to have hedges that are, you know, making losses, even though that may be what they're exactly supposed to do in order to smooth. And then uh, they're always tweaking based on where the euro is today versus what they think it uh, makes sense and we're taking, basically taking positions based on their view. And there, it, it, to me, it starts to look like speculation, speculation. And then to your other question of whether, you know, it's just accounting risk uh, and is it really impacting your valuation, I think it, it, it depends on, it is a little bit of a confusing uh, non-standard lingo in this space. So, uh, I do hear that a lot, but I think people mean different things, and it bears a little bit of clarification, right? So if people mean by counting risk, they mean translation risk, then technically, yes. Um, you know, just uh, currency movement by itself just uh, translates your local currency earnings into fewer or more dollars, and that seems like just accounting. However, over time, even this risk, when you're dividending your earnings out of your local markets into your parent company, then you realize the cash flow impact, and hence your valuation will be impacted. Um, so it depends on what, what people think. I mean, if sometimes people think it, they say it doesn't matter, but uh, they're thinking um, from corporate cash on the balance sheet, say Venezuela in hyperinflationary markets where you may be denominated in those countries in, in U.S. dollar rather than local currency, and in which case currency movement immediately translates into cash flow impact and P&L impact. So uh, I think the answer is, depends on what people mean, but in most cases, eventually currency moves, especially if they're secular uh, and not just uh, mean reverting and coming back to their initial levels, they end up actually impacting the valuation over time. Right, yeah, I've heard companies recently talk about, you know, wanting to increase hedging as cash accumulates offshore and that sort of thing, so that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Wolfgang, also, I think we talked about sometimes before about um, 
hedge accounting and whether, you know, companies can hedge risk that they can't get hedge accounting for and, and what you think of that. Is that, how can companies sort of justify that to their managers? Uh, when they don't get hedge accounting? What the yeah. question is? Yeah. Um, well, I think that it goes back to clear communication and not ensuring that, that uh, pe or ensuring that people are not surprised. So, um, you know, hedge accounting is there for specific reasons that we all know that came out of uh, not so good accounting practices from a very few companies, unfortunately, so that, that created to the masses of it. But at the end of the day, I think that there's a portion of it that makes sense, but people need to, need to really make, people have to make the decision, do I want to manage my risk towards accounting or do I want to, at the end of the day, hedge my, hedge my risk towards economics? That's a decision that's very individual and the corporations take one of two views. Wolfgang, this is this is a myth. And just uh, just to add to that, um, you know, at one an analytics, I agree with what you said. But one analytics that we end up doing, if we ever have a situation where we may not get hedge accounting, is to say, uh, you know, in typically uh, typically, if at least when looking at historical patterns, what kind of P and L volatility you may be owning up if you if you are just taking the derivative without without the without hedge accounting, and if that. P&L volatility outweighs your FX volatility, then you've done nothing. You've achieved nothing, right? Um, so right. therefore, you have to be careful of, of that, of course. Yeah, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, just on, you know, I guess one other question is that came from the audience was, um, do you hedge 100% of your exposures, or do you hedge a lesser amount? Maybe each of you could sort of give um, a short response on, you know, whether it's worth it to hedge 100% of exposures or lesser amount um, sort of quickly in the next minute, starting with Amit. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, and I, I would say, you know, it depends on your comfort with your forecast because, uh, again, going back to hedge accounting, which is a fact of life, um, if you end up consistently over hedging, um, then you end up, uh, your hedge accounting end up getting pulled from you and you may not, never get it back. So people conservatively, um, try not to hedge all of it. We don't hedge all of it. Um, we want to hedge uh, as much as we feel comfortable based on historical patterns that we'll end up not over hedging. Uh, Bilal. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, um, and I'm speaking as a researcher, you know, so I'm kind of thinking about this kind of from a, the ivory tower, so to speak. I would, I would kind of almost think about um, to keep things simple, kind of a dynamic hedging program where one would have a low hedge, say 25% hedge, a medium hedge, say like a 50% hedge, and a high hedge, say 75% hedge. And uh, so that would be my three choices. And what would lead me to pick one or the other would be a function of some very simple metrics, which would be a combination of um, the, how over or undervalued the currency is. If it's very cheap or very expensive, that would give me a, a stronger signal. The level of carry, so the level of interest rates, and how trending the currency is. So combining those three factors together, uh, depending on what it, you know, what it would it would tell me, then I'd you know put on the um, uh, appropriate hedge. Then, so for example. If I have a, if I'm a U.S.-based company and I have an exposure to, say, Korea, um, if valuations say that the Korean one is extremely expensive, interest rates are very low, and the currency has generally been weakening recently, that would give me a signal to hedge that currency at 75% at the highest level. Um, and, and, you know, uh, as an example, and, and if it was the opposite, if it was very cheap, uh, interest rates were high and it was trending up, then that would give me a signal to have a very low hedge. So I'd kind of have a, so a dynamic way of hedging, which would incorporate some kind of fundamental factors for the currency and, and then do it accordingly. Great. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and this, uh, Wolfgang. This, this, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to add to that just, I mean, I thought those were really good and pointed answers, which I don't want to repeat uh, on. I think that the couple of points that I'd like to make is, you know, when people think about hedging and not hedging, we obviously talk to lots of corporations, and just like Bilal does, is I think they categorize that in two, if not three areas. One, do I manage currency risk on my balance sheet? Two, do I manage currency risk on my cash flows? And three, do I do economic hedging, just for starters? And we 
Now, when we started this company years ago, it was already a trend that the majority of companies were managing some sort of risk on their balance sheet. And I would say that today um, we see very few companies that don't manage at least partially their balance sheet risk, very, very few. Um, I think it's in excess of 95% that there. I think when it comes to the cash flow, in part because of hedge accounting, that still is roughly a 50, 55% of companies uh, manage that risk. And when it then comes to the pure economic risk, um, it is less than 15% of companies that manage that risk. So hopefully that gives you a general answer towards, you know, to hedge or not to hedge in general in those three categories. Then go to further into the conversation about we, when you're in those three risks, are you managing, you know, 100% or not 100%? Um, we think on the balance sheet side, we see an increased amount where we're actually seeing more and more companies have benchmarks where they want to be within the quarter 95% or higher hedged. And the 5% are typically because it is pretty expensive to hedge there, so it is not that they're willing to, that, that they're just blindly managing 100% of their exposures. I think when it comes to the cash flow hedge, that's a little bit more difficult because depending on the time horizon of, Am I looking at the, this next six months, 12 months, or the next 60 period, or five years? And um, you're seeing hedge ratios there being significantly lower and averaging probably roughly around 65 70% for the ones that are doing the hedging. So I think that you, you can see the parallel of those three areas. Hopefully that helps. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for a really uh, rousing discussion. You know, Sounds like there's a lot to watch in the coming year with China and uh, emerging markets currencies and commodity prices and, um, you know, companies trying to respond to those while trying to get growth. Um, I think I'll hand it back to Andy. Is there anything you wanted to say to wrap up? Yeah, again, we've, we've had a number of questions that have, have come in over the uh, Q&A channel. I will uh, grab those and, and uh, package those up and, and uh, get those over to the appropriate people to facilitate responses. But uh, Wolfgang, uh, if you want to make some uh, closing comments uh, around to, to the uh, audience and the panel, uh, why don't you go ahead and close this out? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for that. First of all, Emily, thank you very much for creating it lively and not uh, uh, having us do three different monologues. I thought that was very good. Thank you, Emily, for that. Uh, Bilal, thank you for the insight of that. And uh, the audience may or may not have seen that today we have come out uh, with a joint uh, announcement where after two years of a uh, trial partnership um, where we really tried to make sure how could a bank work with an organization, a um, technology software company like ours jointly, which has been extremely successful, actually more successful than was originally even anticipated. We have uh, formalized a, a three-year partnership, which you can read about um, in various news channels, but for the ones that hadn't seen, I'm very excited and thank you. Uh, Bilal, as well as your colleagues at Deutsche Bank for a great partnership over the last few years and looking forward to many more. And then, uh, Amit, thank you so very much for being a great customer. Your insights today were really great. I mean, I really have to say, not every time that we get somebody of your quality with your intellect and knowledge uh, to field the questions and to really give perspectives that are broad enough and not just specific to one organization, but then integrate that into an organization. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. So with that, Emily, do you want to close that off? Or? Uh, I'll, t I'll take it, Wolfgang. I, um, uh, Tariq, if there's anything from uh, GT News as we close out, I think uh, we, we've gotten through our agenda. And uh, we, uh, there are a number of questions about making the slides available, so uh, we will certainly do that uh, and make sure that everybody has uh, the available resources. And we've also got some other uh, resources that are available around helping companies assess and understand their emerging market risk. Uh, we have some other white papers and research. Um, the research that we disclosed uh, at the outset of this is also available on our website, or you can send requests uh, along with the request for the, uh, the slides, and, and we'll make that research available as well. So thanks, everybody. Tarika, we want to close this out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andy, Emily, Wolfgang, Bilal, and Amit, for your highly insightful presentation. And for the participants, we hope this webinar has given you strategic insights into market drivers to watch in 2014. We look forward to welcoming you to another GT News webinar in the future. And as Andy did mention, you will be receiving the recording and the PowerPoint within the next week. Many thanks, and have a great day.